So my name is Emily Kimathi. I am a geospatial research officer uh, based at uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, working for International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology. Uh, I will be presenting uh, the work that we did on uh, desert locusts. So, uh, so we did uh, modeling work where we were uh, modeling uh, <coughs> desert locust breeding grounds in East Africa using an ecological uh, niche modeling. So I have co-presenters with me. Uh, my co-presenters are Dr. Henry Tonang and uh, Dr. Elfati Abdelrahman. Uh, okay, so to introduce, as most presenters have uh, spoken today, uh, so East Africa uh, received an unprecedented uh, invasion of desert locusts between uh, towards the end of 2019, and uh, we, are, we are still currently experiencing it in 2020. And this was something that uh, the, most of the countries in the Horn of Africa had not experienced is in almost 70 years. And as a result, it came as a, as a, as a shock to most of the governments. And uh, as you know, these uh, gregarious swans, uh, you know, just uh, landed in most of the pastures and, and, and the vegetation. And uh, some of the areas that were highly infected were the staple crops. So like uh, East Africa really depends, highly depends on uh, maize and sorghum, which is one of the staple crops in, in, the, uh, in the countries. And so this really affected uh, the food insecurity and for the pastoralists, uh, the pasture was uh, highly uh, damaged by the desert locust. So the countries experienced a lot of economic losses as well as uh, food insecurity. Uh, so studies have shown that uh, the behavior, the ecology and the physiology of uh, the, de the desert locust is highly influenced by climatic conditions. So the, the, the changes in climate, which is what happened now at the empty quarter, the, the rainfall that, uh, the huge rainfall that was received in these areas influenced now the ecology and the physiology of the desert locust. And that's when now the gregarious face came in and they were able now to move in huge, huge swarms uh, going all the way to East Africa. And as a result now, these climatic conditions influenced how uh, the desert locust behaved. So in terms of uh, the breeding, uh, desert locust have uh, they breed in very specific conditions and some of the uh, factors that influence the breeding are, is usually the soil they are very specific on the soil type they prefer very loose soil so the, uh, as a result they prefer sandy soil uh, they breed at a specific uh, soil moisture so that's why rainfall becomes a very uh, important factor and also the uh, at a specific temperature so these factors are some of the things uh, that we focused on in our study to try and understand uh, the influencing factors uh, that uh, that could be influencing the, the breeding grounds for desert locust. The prevalent, uh, prevalence of vegetation is also a key proxy because uh, they have to move where this vegetation so that they can feed and after that now they you know they increase in numbers and then the breeding starts. Uh, so our study focused on uh, three aspects. Uh, we first uh, focused on developing a decision support tool we should now uh, be able to advise or direct uh, the policymakers and uh, the people doing uh, the surveillance to be able now to target the areas that are highly suitable for the breeding of, of desert locust. Our second uh, objective was to understand the influence that the environmental variables have on the desert locust breeding grounds. And finally, once we understood these uh, conditions, we now wanted to project the habitat suitability or the habitat niche of the breeding and of the, of the positions of uh, these desert locusts to East Africa. Because remember, these countries, most of them have not experienced this level of uh, outbreak. And as such, we did not have a lot of information on uh, the breeding grounds. So this is just a, a, a graphical uh, explanation of our modeling framework. So we used an ecological niche uh, modeling framework and uh, for this type of modeling we require uh, data and our type of data uh, we look at uh, two sets of data so you require field observation uh, for, for you to develop the model so you require presence data and in addition to that you also require environmental variables so for our case we targeted the environmental variables that are suitable for the breeding of desert locusts then once we acquire the two sets of data, uh, we now uh, uh, applied a machine learning algorithm uh, towards the data to develop the model. So for our case, we use the maximum entropy approach. And this approach uh, utilizes the presence only data 
uh, to be able now to determine the regions that are highly suitable. So once uh, we ran we ran several models uh, and tried to optimize and fine tune the model to come up with the best model. And after that, the output is now uh, you now get a uh, spatial model outputs, whereby you uh, once now the, the the machine learning algorithm integrates uh, all these variables, you come out with one output showing the different uh, suitability levels of the breeding grounds. So the first step was to acquire the data. So we used a secondary historical data, which has been uh, which we sourced from. Uh, FAO. So as uh, I'm sure you've heard from the previous presentation, FAO uh, collects uh, uh, desert locust uh, data and uh, most of the data, as you can see from the map, uh, is usually, has been collected over the years uh, from in the Sahel region and the Middle East uh, as well as uh, Western Asia. So we assessed all these data and uh, we targeted uh, three countries which we used, uh, which we use now to develop the models. So we developed the models uh, for three countries, Saudi Arabia, Mauritania, and Morocco. And the reason we, we targeted these countries, these are countries that have been experiencing desert locust outbreak for a very long time. And as a result, there is a huge data set that has been collected. And so we had enough data to be able to train our model and project uh, to East Africa. In addition uh, to, the, to the field observation, we used uh, four variables, environmental variables, so we looked at uh, temperature. For temperature, we targeted uh, the monthly long-term average data. And uh, the data we used was uh, between December, January, February, and March. And these months were selected because this was, this, this was the window in which uh, East Africa experienced the, the desert locust outbreak. Uh, in addition to temperature, we looked at uh, rainfall, st still targeting the same month. And uh, then we looked at uh, soil moisture, which was a long-term average uh, data set. And lastly, we sourced data for sand content at a depth of 5 to 15 centimeters depth. Uh, this depth was uh, selected because of uh, this, this is the depth to which now the desert locust uh, buries its eggs uh, during the oviposition. Uh, all this data was sourced from different sites. Uh, we sourced the climatic data from WorldClim the soil moisture from NOAA and the uh, sun content uh, from uh, ISRIC. So this is just a workflow to show how we uh, developed our work. So uh, the three countries that we targeted now are Saudi Arabia, Mauritania and Morocco. And uh, what we did is we developed uh, models for these uh, countries using the maximum entropy. So we incorporated the presence records together with the environmental uh, variables these variables underwent uh, pre-processing and uh, cleaning of the data. Then we developed the models uh, for these three countries. Then once we did that, we went now to a second step to now try and uh, validate or evaluate the model performance. So what we did is we would uh, develop the model for Saudi Arabia, then project to the two countries, Mauritania and Morocco. Then we'd do that to the, to the, to the other countries. So we now develop the model for Mauri Mauritania, and project to Morocco and Saudi Arabia and vice versa. So this was done to be able now to understand which of the three countries uh, performed best in projecting uh, the, the, the suitability to the other countries. So to be able to do the validation, we did uh, some statistics and model validation. And after that, we now selected one country which performed the best. And this country would now be used to project uh, the, the similar conditions for desert locust breeding to East Africa. Uh, so once we now develop the model for East Africa, the model also underwent some validation and evaluation of the model. And for that, we are able now to ascertain that our model uh, predicted the, you know, the, the regions that have been uh, have undergone uh, the, the the breeding in, in these in the breeding grounds in these countries. In addition to that, we did a vegetation assessment. So uh, as we know, vegetation is a proxy of uh, desert locusts. Uh, movement. So we overlaid our model on the vegetation uh, anal um, data, and that was would now assist in uh, understanding the regions that are highly susceptible to the breeding. Uh, so these are the results for uh, the three countries, uh, that is Morocco, Mauritania, and Saudi Arabia. And as you see, we have three, uh, nine maps, and this is because we developed nine models, whereby we now develop uh, 
let me just show you. yes so this is now morocco developing this is the morocco model uh developed using its own presence records and then once you develop the model we now projected a morocco model to mauritania and saudi arabia and we did the same for saudi arabia projected to morocco and mauritania uh, then we developed the model of mauritania and projected to morocco and saudi arabia so by doing so we were able now to evaluate uh, the model and see which of these three countries was able to project best to the other countries so as you will see, uh, once we develop the model, we overlaid independent records, presence records on these countries to now validate and see which of the models performed best. And as you will see, uh, maybe just to explain, perhaps you're not able to see the legend quite well. The, the areas that are shaded red, these are the regions that uh, show very, very high probability of, uh, of uh, breeding in, in these countries. So. Uh, once you evaluate, you'll realize that uh, Morocco uh, performed best in projecting the suitable areas uh, breeding sites in Mauritania as well as uh, Saudi Arabia in comparison to the other uh, three countries. So to, in order to, do, to, to really validate uh, these models, we went a step further to do some statistics. So we did some descriptive statistics and model validation to now uh, statistically justify uh, why uh, Morocco performed best. So for this we now extracted the values, uh, the, the, pro the projected values and um, correlated the values with the, with the presence records that were uh, developed in the field. Once we did that now we, do, uh, we did some uh, histogram and normal distribution curves and uh, this was to show, to see which of the models had more points uh, leaning towards one. Because normally in a model, a uh, model usually has a range of probabilities ranging from 0 to 1, whereby 1 shows very high uh, suitability of, uh, of the species that, that you're modeling. So the more skewed uh, a graph would be towards 1, the better the model performed. And uh, as you see, uh, so these initials indicate the countries. So for this chart, this was Morocco projecting to Mauritania. Saudi Arabia projecting to Mauritania, Morocco to Saudi Arabia, Mauritania to Saudi Arabia, and uh, Mauritania to Morocco, and lastly, Saudi Arabia to Morocco. So from the, the three charts, you realize that uh, the highest, the, the two charts that had the highest mean was uh, Morocco projecting to Mauritania with a mean of uh, 0 0.85, uh, while the chart of Morocco projecting to Saudi Arabia was 0.84. In terms of skewness, you realize um, the two charts were more skewed towards uh, one. So this was a justification to show that Morocco performed best in uh, projecting to, uh, to to the other countries. And uh, uh, once we realize this, we now uh, settled on using Morocco to project to East Africa. So once we did the projection, these were the results. Uh, so the countries that we targeted in East Africa, we did not... Uh, model all the countries we looked at Kenya, Uganda, uh, South Sudan and Sudan. So our model uh, showed that uh, in Kenya vast areas of uh, the northern and the eastern part of the country uh, were highly are highly susceptible towards uh, being habitat niche of uh, breeding grounds for desert locust. For Uganda um, most of the, the part that was highly, that was modeled to show very high suitability was in the northeastern part of the country. While in South Sudan, the northern region and uh, the southeast corner of the country had a uh, high suitability. Uh, for South Sudan, uh, uh, vast areas, almost most part of the country showed uh, to be very high, uh, highly suitable uh, for the breeding grounds. So in addition to the model itself, we evaluated the model whereby 70% uh, uh, of the data that was used to train, uh, 30, sorry, 30% 30 of the data that uh, the field observation we had were used to evaluate uh, the model, where the 70% was used to train the model. In addition to that, we used uh, georeference data that had been collected in Kenya and overlaid it on the model to actually uh, just uh, see whether our model uh, performed best and you will realize that majority of the points uh, where data was collected in the field showed to be highly uh, suitable for the breeding. 
uh, same case with Sudan. So we were able to get data for Sudan and Kenya. And that was now a third step of uh, trying to evaluate the models. Uh, so the model evaluation, which is what I was discussing, so we use the AUC, which is now the area under curve, to be able now to evaluate the performance of the East African model. Uh, so our AUC mean was uh, 0.821, which is uh, quite high, uh, because studies show that uh, any values greater than 0.7 demonstrate high model uh, performance. So that showed that our model uh, performed quite well. Uh, another uh, aspect we used to validate our model was the jackknife test. So the jackknife test is used to now understand the influence that the environmental variables had on the on the model. And as you will see, so we have three colors on this uh, on this chart. So the cyan color shows uh, how the model would perform if the variable was not included in the model. Well, the deep blue uh, color shows the contribution that the variable has to the model uh, if, uh, if once when you only use the model by itself. And then the red uh, color shows now when you incorporate all the variables. So from this chart, what we understand is that temperature and soil moisture decreases the model value gain the most when it is omitted. This shows that these two variables uh, have a very significant influence or contribution to the model. That shows also how much these variables also uh, influence the, the the suitability of the of the breeding grounds. In addition to the model, we also did uh, vegetation analysis. So this was uh, to to now understand uh, the regions uh, the the onset of vegetation because as you know. Uh, desert locusts always have to, they, they have to find some green vegetation to feed on to be able now to move into a certain area. So we overlaid our model, uh, the, the regions with very high suitable uh, regions for desert locusts, uh, the, the projected models. We overlaid it on a greenness index. So this greenness index data set is a data set that has been developed to highlight the onset of vegetation that has occurred for the last 10 days. So the red patches that you see on the maps in the four in the four countries, these are the regions that had onset of vegetation for the last ten days uh, between the month of February to April 2020. So areas that intersected between these pockets of onset of vegetation with our projected models, these are regions that uh, show very high probability of uh, getting the, the the hopper bands, which could have hatched now after after the eggs were laid. So these are the regions now that the surveillance team uh, could, this, this map could now act as a, as a decision tool to, to be able to understand the regions that they, they should now target when they're doing uh, the surveillance. So the analysis helped to dynamically detect the progression of the changes in the breeding location due to the temporal uh, variation in the onset of vegetation. So as we know, vegetation is very uh, temporal and dynamically changes. So it is best to now monitor this onset of vegetation to be able now to determine the areas that require urgent intervention before now the, the desert locust moves to other regions. Yeah, so to conclude, uh, these maps, uh, our hope or uh, the, the, our, our objective is that the, the maps could be used as a tool that could guide uh, the survey teams or the prospectors while they're going to scout for the regions that have hopper bands, this can really guide them to cost-effectively manage or monitor the potential breeding areas. In addition to that, the analysis has also assisted in uh, giving us information on the influence that environmental variables have on the habitat niche. Uh, so the information could also guide in early warning and preparation. So in, in, in countries like this which have not experienced uh, desert locust invasion in a long time. This information could be quite good for for the for the policymakers and the governments to now prepare and prioritize uh, the ground surveillance on the desert locust breeding and the deployment of the best bed solutions for effective management of the desert locust. So to conclude, uh, the my the recommendation is that it is very critical uh, to strengthen ground surveillance and to mostly target on the hopper bands because uh, I believe it's quite easier to manage hopper bands uh, compared to when the swans now start flying around and that becomes quite difficult.
to be able now to do the spraying and all that. So if uh, the if now the survey teams are able to target uh, the hopper bands, this could now create very timely and effective uh, management of desert locust. Uh, thank you very much. So our work, <laughs> so we have uh, published our work. Uh, you can get our work on, a, we published it on a scientific journal, that is Scientific Reports. Uh, the paper is open access, so in case you need additional information more on the methodology, uh, you can access our paper and uh, get more information about uh, how we did it. And the beauty of our work is that all the data we used was open source, the software we used was open source, so this data, this information or the methodology can be utilized to develop uh, predictive models in other countries. Uh, moving forward, we are working towards developing uh, models in A India and Pakistan to be able now to predict the breeding grounds. Yes, uh, just to finish, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the donors supporting uh, ECP. It's because uh, the, in one way or another, they have provided financial support to the organization. And it's because of these that we have been able to do this work. Thank you very much.